Hey, how you doing? I'm Dan McGee. Welcome to my garage. So I'm working on another video and this one was shot around uh, July of uh, 2006 and it was of uh, Max Gale, uh, the actor, um, musician, poet, and uh, a lot of people don't realize what a, a great humanitarian he is too. Um, but I'm just going to uh, let the video um, speak for itself. So, on with the show. Hope you like it. This is a lap banner we made for an Earth Day event over in the San Fernando Valley a couple of years ago and we had a lap table there and then I was part of the you know, entertainment and, and, and actually got to introduce Michael Franti and Spearhead which was cool because my, my friend Wonder Knack, who I've known since she was five, and Wonder does all of their uh, video, edited the video Mike, Michael Franti has out right now about his trip to Iraq and all, and Michael Franti's a, a San Francisco musician and the, the group Spearhead has really got a great uh, kind of spiritual, political consciousness about what they're doing in their music. So I wish we had put up here an open invitation too, because that's what I always I've come to think of LAP as an open invitation. And a, a proposal is an invitation. A proposal of marriage is kind of an invitation to an open heart, open mind, open source, open space, open game. And to go backwards with, them, with those, then the idea of open game is the sort of the opposite of a closed game or what is. Um, uh, called a not uh, a, uh, a a zero sum game, meaning that there is a for every winner there's a loser. Uh, tennis is a zero sum game. Chess, any game that's played to a conclusion that creates a winner and a loser, is a zero sum game. And when the, back in the pre World War II, when John von Neumann and, and and others were coming together and creating the looking for the mathematics around games or interactions amongst people that had consequences and payoffs. And they looked at the zero-sum games first because it was easiest to figure out the mathematics of it. One of the ones they looked at a lot was the, the duel. Because uh, in a duel you have dynamics like, you know, where the two people stand back to back and then they walk 20 paces or whatever and then they turn around and, uh, and if I take longer to fire at you, I have a better chance of shooting you but I have a better chance of getting hit during that time. So there's a kind of a set of, well, if you choose this, you choose that, what, what, what the back and forth of it might be. If you get to fire more shots, then you might fire a shot quickly to, to, just to disorient the other person. But anyway, those are elements in the duel that then got taken into, um, there were other things like the prisoner's dilemma, Two people are in prison, they're, both, they're accused of a crime, they can't talk to each other. If, uh, if they both admit they did it, they serve a long prison sentence. If they both say they didn't do it, they both go free. But if one of them says they did it and the other one says they didn't, then the one that says they, they didn't has an even longer prison term and the other guy gets to go free. So it's kind of like, well, how, what would the moves, what would moves would you make in a game like that? So it was used a lot in, uh, game theory was used a lot in deciding if the Allies sent bombers over Germany, the Germans would send up fighter pilots to shoot them down. So the Allies needed to send a certain number of fighter pilots along with the bombers to protect them. But if they sent too many, then the Allies could just keep their fighter pilots on the ground, throw a whole lot of flak up in the air. So the dynamics of, well, what did you do last time? What are you going to do next time? What did they do last time? All of that had mathematicians and others working on game theory, and that was used very much a part of those strategies. Then it got taken into our diplomatic strategies in the Cold War. So all of the Cold War was based on the kind of scientific mathematical exploration of zero-sum games. Win, there's a winner and a loser. And the best we came out of that through the Cold War was the kind of mutually assured destruction. So we kept from, because actually 
life is an open game or a non-zero-sum game. It involves zero-sum games, and we put parentheses around that's the basketball game, but and in, in non-zero-sum games or open games, you can have win-lose and win-win and lose-lose. And we don't talk about that much, so we default kind of always think we're playing that zero. There's somebody we're getting together to beat. There's somebody that's our competitor or something, and we went a lot in business and in, in, the, in just our contemporary world today, we have a tendency to look at everything as if it's a zero-sum game, and what that does is it biases the system toward lose-lose, just like what's going on right now over in with Israel and, and um, in the Middle East, because each side is looking that the only way they can win is for the other side to lose, and they want it, so they say, well, let's just destroy this other side, and they can't, can't put it in a context of an open game. So LAP is about that. LAP is an open game. It's about finding out how the, we can best cooperate with each other. And open space, the idea of open space has been around for a long time in terms of the landscape around us. And there are, um, there are lots of uh, uh, differences within there. It's kind of a spectrum, you know, if you, so some people open space is land that humans just don't go to, and uh, yet in the kind of parks and recreations world, open space can often mean a field that could be used for soccer or baseball or picnicking or so, but there's certainly the sense of, of open space as opposed to closed space, private space, uh, own space, space that you can't go to. So there's that idea of open space, and then there's the idea of open space that Harrison Owen uh, came up with a number of years ago. Harrison had been one of the first Peace Corps trainers uh, back in the in the in the 60s. Uh, he's a man in his early 80s now. Uh, over the years, he did lots of community building conferences and work in Africa and in the United States, and and uh, so he had lots of experience with putting gatherings together. Yeah, thanks. Lots of experience with. Uh, with bringing people together to have, have conversations and share what they knew and get on the learning curve together uh, um, around community building. And the time came where he just um, uh, in his version of the story anyway, he just uh, didn't, he had, he had learned that, that no matter what, the, how well they planned out a conference and who would be in the panels and what this what the breakout sessions would be and so on and so forth the feedback was always that the best times were the open spaces so he eventually came up with some simple um, uh, uh, principles and uh, and the law that were the essence of open space technologies he called it and that was that the four uh, principles are that it begins when it begins who's there is who is supposed to be there what happens is what is supposed to happen, and when it's over, it's over. And the one law is the law of two feet, which says that if you feel you're in a, in a group, a session, that you don't feel like you're learning or contributing, well, get up and go somewhere. Go walk around and think, or go check out some other group or something. So the main uh, protocol of open space technologies as a, as a methodology for people to come together and create their agenda on the fly uh, is that people get in a big circle and there are papers on the floor and pens and when uh, the, these, these, what I'm explaining is kind of explained and anybody that has a topic that they think is important they go and they get pick up one of those pieces of paper and they write on uh, you know community technology centers and then I, think, I think this is an important topic for we, us to to share and they, they kind of say a few words about that to the to the group and then they go over and there will have been a grid put up and they'll, they'll place their paper somewhere on that grid of one of the possible sessions that's been opened. You know, if you have a day, well then you might have broken it down into six one-hour periods or something. So all of that is set up appropriate to the number of people and spaces and, and whatever. And and then when, when all of that's been done, everybody that's, you know, had something important they think should be talked about has had the opportunity to 
to speak to that and they become responsible for that session. They can delegate the facilitation or the note taking or anything, but they're responsible for it. So it kind of takes away the grumbling about, well, they should have had a session on this, that, or the other thing. And over the years, open space technologies has been used with groups from, you know, 30 to 3,000, uh, meeting for an afternoon to a week. And it's just, um, while people hearing about it for the first time would tend to think that'll never work, it actually works beautifully. And um, most recently, I finally met Harrison Owen uh, up at a uh, gathering of about somewhere between three and four hundred people from around the world, some from Africa, some from the Middle East, some from Ireland, some from Colombia, some from different parts of North and South America, uh, um, or Canada and the United States, and around practice of peace. So it was a four-day gathering using open space as a methodology to bring people together and explore this notion of the practice of peace and people from different faiths and different backgrounds and people bringing in other wonderful method methodologies like, like um, uh, uh, um, a kind of deep listening, uh, um, different kinds of inquiry, different processes that have been developed by people um, whose giftedness is in the realm of helping other people come together and have a good conversation with each other. So, so the other final thing about open space, there's open space in the landscape, there's open space within how we spend our time together, and there's this whole idea of open space in our minds because so much of our mind space is, you know, just sort of put it, let's say, think of our kids today, how much of their mind space is, has been um, uh, filled out by Disney and Lego and so on and so forth. So there's a, the, the notion of open space in the mind, which in a way is part of what open space in the landscape is about providing people with a place to go and let their mind air out of all of the advertising messages and so on and so forth that that come to us. So, so certainly LAP is about open space and also open and open game and, and about that as open as a verb as well as an adjective, you know, the process of opening space. And uh, because you have to hold space in a certain way to open it. It's a paradox. And then open source, well, particularly in the realm of software creation, um, open source has taken on a huge meaning. It's certainly, um, uh, uh, you know, the concept has been proven that that the cooperative impulse in people to create something together can can uh, you know express itself in the ways that so that one of the probably the, the biggest alternative to Windows desktop operating system would be Linux and in the server market. In the server market, the open, open source server software has a huge percentage of the market, both with Linux and, and Apache and stuff. But the basic idea of open source, rather than, let's say, closed source, somebody owns the source code, they've written it, they can license it out, you pay for it, open source basically is the source code is made available to people and the idea is that no one owns it and everyone can use it and anyone can improve it but if you can't you can't take open source and make an improvement on it and say ah oh, well to use my improvement you got to pay for it if you're going to use the open source that's been created and make an improvement on it that has to be made, be made available for others and um, but there's a place for people to um, support that with the traditional business or closed source. So uh, there's a company called Red Hat that will go out on the internet for you and, and, and assemble out of all of the possibilities of Linux open source software a really good combination of those things They've created their own CD, um, you know, so that you can install, so you don't have to do that, because there are a lot of people who would like to run Linux, but they don't want to go through that part of it and have a help desk and stuff. So there's a relationship between closed source and open source. And a part of that relationship has been, over the years, 
kind of those the people that think that Microsoft is the dark empire and Microsoft thinking open source is the dark empire. So there's been a kind of competition there, but over time it's really um, evolved in a way. IBM, you know, has uh, put a couple of billion dollars last year or the year before into open source to, to since they are now helping big companies and organizations get um, get with it with their information technology programs, they need to be able to tell them what open source possibilities are out there rather than proprietary software, software that's owned, closed source that they would need to pay somebody for. So it's just starting to make its way into the realm of content where we have this notion of content being copyrighted and owned by somebody and there's a there's a, a value in that so people stuff people create something they need to be supported as artists or creators and there's also the part of it that is if somebody can rip it off and then act like they own it and, and then they can have exclusive use of it so within that whole realm has evolved again over this last 10 20 years but has evolved notions of copyright that's kind of called a copy left or the creative commons so their ways have evolved for people to be able to make stuff they've created available for people and if they want to make it available for nonprofit use for free they want to make it available but be sure that the source is acknowledged um, if it's used for for profit there's some kind of licensing so that whole realm of how to deal with open source which at the basis of it is the part of evolution that we we now understand that evolution is as much about cooperation as it is about competition we are individually a big collection of cells you know there's uh, there's there's just um, and certainly society and and, uh, and mankind and it's, so evolution within the universe has an aspect of cooperation about it that's a kind of a yin yang relationship with competition which is a word that's root meaning is to strive together. So it's like the either or and the both and. You can't have either or without both and. You can't have both and without either or. So that's open source, open game, open space, open source. And open mind is, um, and open heart, these are notions that have, that have been around and explored and have many aspects to them. So it's not, there's not one capsulization on open mind or the process of opening mind, but one thing, just one one uh, way of looking at it is just that we're all operating on a, our unconscious and subconscious and conscious levels and have dominations. You know, there might be some some of us are uh, um, um, we're just visual. We're more we're more visual than what we're looking at. Some people might be very distracted by me playing with my glasses, haven't heard anything I've said. Other people. Have, they're, they're or, orally, on a conscious level, they get what they hear. So they might be just not even watching this, you know, because they're just listening to this. So we have these differences of the way we are oriented. In, each of us as individuals, uh, which of, which of those is our strongest? And when on a conscious level, are we are we visual or oral, oral or kinesthetic? And um, and on a, on, a, on a subconscious and unconscious level. So there's a, probably a pretty hard to follow little kind of example of what open mind, but a notion of open mind in terms of, uh, in terms of dialogue, it's the aspect of dialogue that is suspending our held positions. You could say that's a part of open mind, mindedness and opening mind is to, is to suspend, not to not to throw away our convictions or our precon preconceptions, but, but just to suspend and hear someone out. And that aspect of dialogue, when people enter into dialogue or a conversation with a center rather than sides, as David Isaac says, and um, uh, the art of, of, of uh, thinking together, you know, and it can involve a, a, part, a part of that which is just getting stuff out what different people are thinking, what they have in their minds and hearts and their visions, and and there's there's a, a resistance we'll have to that often because there's a feeling, well, if I say that, it's going to kind of break the, the. There's a natural thing we want our groups, 
groups to kind of hold together. And so often dialogue involves taking enough risk that people speak in a level way, you know, and truthfully out express what, what's in their hearts and what their visions are, than to go through a period of suspension in order to hear enough to see how it fits together. And then that collective energy we have to support the group becomes about how do we make all this fit together rather than how do we keep from somebody saying something that might make somebody else uncomfortable or might, you know, mess with traditional comfort zones. So a big part of lap, for instance, is to when people lap in and share what's in their lap to get the get but putting the notion of lap in motion by running laps. That's the first part to lap in. Often people check in. That's a part of the process when people come together, but there's a very Un, often unspoken, but definite ideas of what's what you can bring and what not to bring. You know, your your institutional name, rank, and serial number is okay, and maybe your institution's, you know, what who are you with? What company are you with? What, what nonprofit are you with? What's that mission statement? But LAP is has more to do with the human beings getting together and understanding each other. So part of sharing what's in your LAP is what's also in your personal domain. So that's it, an open heart is uh, like open mind, it's a, it's a, there's, there's, I, stay away from any convenient hook about this is what lap means by open heart, but we certainly not only have the way we use heart to kind of think about the sort of mental realm and emotional realm, but we've, we've, we also know that the heart in, in, intelligence runs throughout the body, and um, um, and, the, and emotions are a part of how all intelligence is is um, uh, it, it expresses itself. So, so the relationship of open heart and open mind uh, is a a deep and rich and wonderful one, and I got no button hook for it. It's more about with lap then as an open invitation to an open so open heart, open mind, open source, open space, open game, is a kind of med meditation on that, an exploration where people bring what that means to them into it and hear what that means to others. And so that collective wisdom and understanding emerges out of the out of the process and the practice of running laps rather than imposing something. But there are many, many wonderful people who have sh shared and put together wonderful things in forms of books and stories and music and movies and graphics and uh, dances and, and, uh, and cultural legacies and, uh, and, um, and prophecies of the future and uh, all, all of which uh, uh, can be uh, um, lab can be a way to connect to others, to find those sources and bring and, and bring yours in and share them. This lap logo has a story behind it that I'd like to share, and I'd like to start with just talking about the center and these four sections and the four colors. And a lot of people look at it right away and say that's like a multiple yin yang, and it is, and I, and I'll get to that. But I want to start with these four colors, and in particular, well, one of the things that's, in the, as, as my uh, life in growing up and being born and growing up in North America, and eventually I, it led me to actually knowing Native American people and Native American culture and, and coming to understand a lot of the, you know, the, 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 the amount of diversity and, and the valuing of that diversity within and amongst the various Native American cultures, but there is, there is a kind of universal runs through in the same way that the circle is universal to humans and uh, almost to all cultures. Uh, the four directions and the four sacred colors, which are usually black, white, red, and yellow, and often in the modern era talked about as representing the four races. In a way, what's different about that is it, it, it recognizes uh, Native Americans as a distinct race, as opposed to 
members of the Mongoloid race who wandered over the Bering Strait. And that's one version of the sort of historical record. It's, we're coming to understand that people, humans, have been here way longer than the, that since the last ice age and may have come other ways and on the ocean. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's much more that we don't know about how we are all related, but we know we're all related. And race itself is a kind of an abstract that doesn't really have as nearly as much scientific basis as people tend to think that it does. And there's always the issue, well then, well, what are biracial or multiracial human, you know. So what I wanted to focus on about that is that that notion of the four directions and the four colors and the fours, at the same time, particularly amongst the Plains Indian and the Pipe religion, which has its different or spiritual way, has its different understandings and, and uh, ways, but there is something universal about the notion of the stem of the pipe representing all that's, that's, that's male in life and the bowl representing what's female and putting them together and then, then you have life and the understanding that then the, the, the pipe becomes the center of the universe, which is... What for me was going on was I was seeing a, a kind of commonality in what I understood of the Tao, uh, that, what that yin-yang, that one male, female, dark and light, night and day, these way that the opposites kind of flow in and are part of one. And that's a real deep, you know, the notion of spirit, if we, if we think in terms of kind of matter, body, mind, soul, spirit, and spirit being also the ground out of which it all arises. This, this understanding how we, we use these words in the mental realm, we have words that we have to talk about the physical realm, you know, and we have words that we use to really identify and create the mental realm, words like justice and peace, and, and then we have the mind's ideas about spirit, but just as the physical realm is kind of pre-verbal, or, you know, it's not verbal, it's not a, when, the, when my toe hits the rock, I can use words to describe that, but my toe hitting the rock, there's no words involved there, it's just my toe and the rock. Um, although, you know, there is something different about kicking a rock and kicking a dog as far as what happens to the rock and what happens to the dog, because dogs have an internal mind and body. So, in a mental realm, we can talk about lots of things and do and share, and it's in that circle of sharing that we come to understand what's real in the mental realm. We can validate what's real and what, what is a real interpretation of Hamlet as opposed to it's not a recipe for strawberry shortcake. And, but in the mind's idea of spirit, we get paradoxical thinking. It doesn't mean there isn't value there, but this, the idea of the yin-yang, if you were just to sort of think of this as just this is all white and this is all black and the familiar yin-yang is that these flow in the one circle is kind of the one and then the two halves flowing in, in and out of each other. And I found myself thinking, how do these fit together? And I was just caught up in, in how that might work as a diagram, you know, as a graphic. And the yin-yang circle, this circle, is half of this circle. That's how that works. And so that continues out, and if you do that, you make a circle, you start getting, and then keep spiraling it out, you get a spiral relationship that's a, there's a constant, like pi is the relationship of the distance across the circle and the distance around it, and it's a real constant in the universe. But it's not a number that ever settles down on one number in the way we, we think of numbers, is 3.1417, whatever, it goes on out infinitely. And phi is another relationship like that, that is that, that spiral that's got its other approximations like Fibonacci series and stuff, but it shows up in the, in the sunflower, it shows up in the spiral galaxies, it shows up throughout the universe, this, this spiral. So I was playing with those and say, well, if the spiral went out and kept going out, except I wrapped another circle around it, Say, if I fill those colors in with the other colors of the rainbow, that was just something I was doing and it ended up um, 
for a while some beadwork on some moccasins I had and then became the lap logo because the things that I was looking to integrate just in my own thought of colors and stuff of the the four races meaning like well all the races even we're all one human race we're all that and and then uh, say well what if this is uh, earth and sky or earth and ocean and and sunrise and sunset or some, you know just to however that's that's sort of what's in that and then a friend of mine put this together digitally and these dots here ended up being in a little different place because of the way he did it but they made little kind of creatures that's the story behind this lap logo so the idea is just to open up thinking thinking about how things are related more about opening up the thinking than having definite condensed something down to an elevator speech and here's another lap logo and if you were to pan in on this damn you know you see there's two figures facing each other this is kind of people have often seen where you see the two profiles make a make a vase or something but we did it here where it it, it has the laps these people's laps so that you can see the vessel this chalice or you can see the figures facing each other you can't see both of those at once but you can look at that and know that that's something that can be one or the other depending on what you put in the foreground and what you put in the background and then these figures sitting in each other's lap represent this idea of the lap there's a there's an exercise people can do it's often seen as a trust exercise people you can get any bunch from maybe eight would be the smallest number but you could do it I have a friend who went to the Air Force Academy they set the record at the time with something 2300 or 2600 cadets or something like that everybody gets in a circle come together shoulder to shoulder turn so that each is watching the back of the one in front has somebody watching their back everybody moves into the center so that you're standing closer than you would normally you wouldn't stand in a movie line that close to somebody because they say hey back off buckshot but where there's the trust to get that close with each other and then to sit down together so that then each person forms a lap for the one in front and sits down on the lap behind them and the whole circle self supports and my friend who went to the Air Force Academy where they his class set that record he said they learned about it because the Roman army they were taught used to sit in lap circles when they were marching across low wet valleys rather than sit down on the ground to rest and they'd lose that body heat when you do this in actuality you don't have quite that much spacing you're actually pretty much back to belly but it's a very real solid feeling and uh, so I call it the lap ohm the lap organizing metaphor it's like often people are coming together to say how can we put our proposal together to get this funding from here or this support from there but the idea of lap is you're looking for where whatever community is lapping where is the support within that and often you know there's someone within that circle that what they're tasked with is to give away money wisely to, to allocate it wisely but sometimes by finding out what everybody has to offer the circle and what support they need you find out you don't need to go out and buy everything you can you can see where that money might need to be applied to get something to happen so that is the story of this banner the open invitation that we forgot to write up there or i didn't think of at the time to the open heart open mind open source open space open game that's what's going on with lap and 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 <clears throat> when i did see harrison owen with going talking about open space at the practice of peace up in oregon the thing that I got most clearly from Harrison, I got two the two things, because he spent every morning, he'd spend an hour or so talking about open space. And then he was around watching and he was often asked to, 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 to offer his thoughts. But there were two things. One thing he was saying, please improve on this. This is not like to be like the religion and now you're all my disciples and you're supposed to go out there. Please improve on it. And the other thing is don't get caught up in it. The open space is only when you're you know got a bunch of people and you're trying to have a conference or something you can actually be opening space all the time 
So in a way, we're lapping all the time. And in a way, just like my lap is here because I'm sitting down and I have some support. So when I stand up, you know, well, there, my, my lap is, so the lap as a part of the body is still about relationship. Relationship to something, and then now I'm maybe on, I'm, I'm, I'm up and moving until the next time I sit down and there's my lap again. But definitely lap is the notion of sitting in a circle together. And how do we hold that circle? How do we speak into that circle? Even so now, I'm like speaking, talking to my friend Dan, and he's holding the camera, and my son Max is sitting over here, and you know, but in a way I'm using that as speaking for the time I have now to speak into the great circle of life. And, it, and I just feel like this is something that, unless it's a part of someone's culture, because they're, you know, I see in some cultures people naturally circle up but for the most part in the modern world people get into there's the panel or the person up front and here's the audience and we get into these other power configurations and have a great deal of difficulty just circling up where everybody owns that circle and it's not about limiting generations or you know, you know it's not about excluding certain people it embraces the social structure that's there uh, and the responsibilities that people have, but at the same time it's like what the anthropologist Victor Turner called communitas. Is it crosses the threshold into that sense of wholeness that sometimes happens when there's an emergency and suddenly people don't worry about whether they get along with that neighbor or whatever, you know, the kind of stuff that's keeping people apart because there's a flood on and people need to get sandbags or they need to get the fire out or they need to get the kids to someplace safe or people start responding and working with each other. So that sense of connectedness that we have in emergency, I could say LAP is about the emerging seas, the conversations and collaborations and consilience and, and uh, you know, just pick all the, all the C words that, you know, it just, just in sense of wordplay, LAP is, a, is a, I say it's a vessel for, for exploration and transformation on the emergent seas. And um, that all seems like a huge amount, as would be if you tried to explain the notion of school or church to someone that didn't know anything about it. I would say that, you know, uh, the vast majority of anybody that would listen to this, if I were to say something is in your lap, you'd know what that meant. It was similar to what's on your plate. It's the dictionary says you're domain of care, charge, control, and responsibility. And we use domains to talk about different different domains of thinking. We, we, we organize the world, you know, you're in one domain when you're crossing a busy highway, and you're in another domain when you're having a dream. And you know, we have lots of different domains that we enter and keep track of and understand kind of what the rules are. So that idea, they could say something is in your lap, or in Dan's lap, or in my lap. We can also say it's in our lap, or it's in the it's in the um, it's in the county's lap, or that's in the lap of the California, you know, the state of California's lap. Uh, our governor might say, or Pat Buchanan likes to say, "Oh, that's in the lap of the Lord." When when people ask him a question, I've heard him say this numerous times. That this, if you're sort of beyond anybody's domain, oh, that's in the lap of the Lord. People don't have trouble making that kind of expansion out. So we have that. It's not, it's not, not nearly as esoteric and weird and confusing as it is when you try to explain it. So the idea that we can lap, let's, let's run a lap around that, meaning let's, let's circle up and share our visions around a certain issue or a certain topic or a certain possibility. And all of this is really what what LAP is about is not to become the brand that differentiates from other ways that people seek to work together, but a, a brand that's owned by all the participants who are looking to transcend and enfold differences and integrate on a higher level of understanding. And um, so, uh, LAP it up. Well. I hope you learned a little about uh, Max and his organization. Um, he's a, a great guy, and actually, if you go to uh, lap.org, 
uh, there's links to where um, uh, you could uh, get to him and talk about it if you are interested in it. So uh, that's about all. Uh, have a great day and cheers to ya.